Hi, I'm Ms. Vazga, and on today's Kindergarten ELD lesson, we are going to be learning more about our senses and how scientists use their senses to observe the world. Our goal today is, today we will learn about the five senses and how people and animals use their senses. When we use our senses, we are observing the world around us. Scientists use their senses and observations to learn about the world. We get more information by using our senses and let's find out what those senses are. There are five senses. The first sense is see or sight. What do you use to see? That's right, you use your eyes to see. You use your eyes to see the world around you. Look around, what do you see? I'm in a classroom, so I see books, I see pencils, I see tables. The, you use your eyes to see, and that's one of our key vocabulary words today, the word see. Another sense that humans and animals use is hearing or the ability to hear. What do you use to hear? That's right, you use your ears to hear. What do you hear right now? My classroom is very quiet, so I don't hear very much. Scientists can use their hearing to make observations about the world. Animals can use their hearing too. Why do you think animals use their hearing? That's right, to warn if there are predators around, to hear if they have food that's nearby. Our ability to hear is one of our senses, so we're gonna put this key vocabulary word next to see. The third sense that we use is the sense of smell. What do we use to smell with? Hmm, that's right. We use our nose to smell with. Smell the air right now. What does that smell like? What do you smell? Maybe your parents are cooking food and that's what you smell. Do animals use their nose too? That's right, animals do use their nose. Their sense of smell can warn them of danger. It can tell them where their food is. It can tell them where their mates are. The sense of smell is really important sense, especially when it comes to observing the world around us. So we're gonna take the sense of smell and put that on our board of vocabulary words. The fourth sense is the sense of touch. I wonder what you touch with. Hmm, is it somewhere over here? Oh right, you touch with your hands. In science, it's, the sense of touch is very important in making observations about the world around us. If we use our hands to touch, we have to make sure we're also safe with things. The sense of touch could be dangerous if you're not being safe. But the sense of touch is very important in making observations about the world around us. It helps us understand better what we're looking at. The sense of touch is the fourth sense. And can you guess what the fifth sense is? Did you guess the sense of taste? What do you taste with? You're right, you taste with your tongue. Your tongue tells you what things taste like. Now in science, we gotta be very careful with the sense of taste. Most of the time, it is not safe to taste things that you are observing. So we have to be very careful with the sense of taste. Do animals use the sense of taste? They do, when they find their food. They're observing the world and they're seeing uh, if the food is healthy for them or if it's good for their bodies. The sense of taste is an important sense 
So we're going to put it up here with the other senses. Let's review the five senses. The sense of sight, you can see. The sense of hearing, you can hear. The sense of smelling, you can smell. The sense of touch, you can touch. The sense of taste, you can taste. Now let's go over our senses using our key sentence stem today. Friends, our sentence stem of the day is, I can hmm. In this blank, we're going to put our key vocabulary words. Let's choose one to demonstrate our oral language skills. Here we go. Let's choose the sense of taste. I can taste. Say it with me. I can taste. Now it's your turn. Are you ready? Go. Nice job. Let's pick one more sense to demonstrate our oral language skills. See. I can see. Say it with me. I can see. Now it's your turn. Nice job. We've gotten our oral language skills. Let's go to our writing skills. I've written our sentence stem two times so we can demonstrate our writing skills. Let's start with the first one. I can hmm. Let's choose a sense and put it in our sentence stem. I know. Let's choose here. Here. Now let's read our sentence. I can hear. Do it with me. I can hear. Now let me hear you do it. Nice job. Let's try one more time. I can hmm. Choose a sense. Did you choose touch? Let's write touch. Touch. Now let's reread what we wrote. I can touch. Now you say it. All right. Now let's choose one more sense and complete our, our whole sentence together. Here we go. Let's choose smell. I can smell. Smell. Good writers go back and reread. Let's check. I can smell. Do it with me. I can smell. Now it's your turn. Nice job. Friends, now that we've demonstrated our oral and our written language skills, I have a special surprise. We get to go to the Denver Zoo today. I'm so excited because I get to go see my friend Connor at the Denver Zoo and he's going to tell us more about how animals use their senses too. Come on and join me. Hi friends, it's Ms. Vesca here at the Denver Zoo and I'm so excited to learn more about our five senses. In a minute here, I'm gonna show you one of my friends and he's gonna tell us more about our senses. While you're at home, think about the senses that you see um, here and touch and taste and, and feel at home. And I want you to think about how you can do that at the zoo or how you can be a scientist and use those, those senses as well. Hi friends, I'm here with my friend Connor at the Denver Zoo and he's going to tell us more about how we use our senses at the zoo and in science. So here at the zoo we use our senses for a lot of things and when I say senses I'm thinking of when we use our eyes to look and see or observe. Um, we can use our noses to smell. Sometimes here at the zoo it gets kind of stinky and that's okay. Um, but we can use our noses to smell. That's another sense. We can also use our ears to hear things. Scientists that study animals here at the zoo use their ears all the time. We can um, use those to listen for different things. Another sense that we have is our sense of touch. 
when we feel things, that's a really great way that we can explore. Scientists do that all the time. Let's see here. And our, uh, another sense that we have, and we don't really do this a lot in science because it can be yucky and it can also be unsafe, is our sense of taste. Um, when we have our snack or our lunch, that's when we can use our sense of taste. So we don't use that all the time in science um, or really ever, just because again, that could be a little unsafe. So what I like to do, and maybe I you can um, participate along with me at home, is I like to do a senses activity. I like to go outside, and it's really simple because you could do this at home, uh, you can do this in your neighborhood. I like to go outside and I like to think about an activity I call five, four, three, two, one. What we can do is we can think about using that activity with our senses. So let's start. I'm going to think about five things that I can use my eyes to see. Right now, I'm gonna look around. I see a tree. That's one. I see some dirt. That's two. I see my friend Krista here. Three. I see behind me there's a building. That's four. And the fifth thing I can see is the sky. So that's five things that I used my eyes to be able to see. I made those observations. Those are things that we can observe when we use what we call our science eyes. Okay, let's try four. Four things I can smell. This might be a little tough. Ready? I smell some dirt because I'm standing in the dirt. Hmm. I smell some grass. Grass. You can smell the grass. That's awesome. We're at the zoo. I can smell some animals. There's some animals all around us and sometimes they're a little stinky and that's okay. Let's see here. And when you're doing this activity, if you can't find all the things, if you can't find four things you can smell, that's totally fine. All right. Um, I think that's about all the things I can smell. So I'm going to go to three things that I can hear. I can hear birds. There's one. I can hear, oh, I can hear some water right over there. That's two. Let's see, I can hear. I can hear crickets. Crickets, that's another thing. That's three things. All right, friends, nice job. Okay, so now we're at the number two, because remember we're going five, four, three, two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to think of two things that I can touch or I can feel. Remember scientists use their sense of touch all the time when they're exploring um, and they're finding out about different things in nature. So right now, I can feel this folder that I'm holding that has a picture of a tiger on it. I can feel that. Let's see here. I can also feel my shirt. My shirt has a special texture to it or it has a certain way that it feels. All right, friends, so my last sense is taste. And again, we don't like to use our sense of taste a lot in science because again, that can be yucky or unsafe. Um, so we can just um, save that for later. When you're having lunch or snack, you can think about using your sense of taste. And then um, we can also think about how animals use their senses. Do you think that animals use their sense of hearing? What do you think? Hmm. Do you think that animals use their eyes for their sense of sight or how they can see? Hmm. What about an animal's sense of smell? Do you think that there are any animals that are really good at smelling? 
I know that I have a pet dog and he has a really good sense of smell. Me too. And then also animals also use their sense of taste. The same uh, thing, my dog loves treats and he uses his sense of taste when I give him treats. So friends, you can um, use this activity at home. You can use those, uh, you can do the five, four, three, two, one activity and you can explore using your senses. And you can also think about how someone who studies nature or studies animals might use their senses um, when they're learning about their surroundings or the things all around them. Hi friends. So we're talking about using our senses today. And remember, when we're talking about using our senses, like right now, I'm gonna use my sense of hearing. I'm gonna use my ears. I just heard a bird right over there. Cause we're here at the Denver Zoo. We hear animal sounds all the time. And people that study animals, animal scientists, they're using their different senses to be able to learn about these animals. So I just used my um, sense of hearing. I used my ears to hear that bird. I hope you heard it too. It sounded really cool. So what I like to, um, to what I want to talk about is when you're at home and you're studying nature, when you're going outside and you are just taking a walk um, down your down the sidewalk on you know on your street or if you're in your on your schoolyard playground. You can use these senses to explore and play. Um, sometimes we can use science tools or we can use these, uh, this shovel or this rake and that would help me if I wanted to dig in the dirt and I wanted to maybe see what was living in this dirt. Do you think you might have an idea about what might be living in this dirt? Hmm. I'm gonna use this shovel here and I'm going to see if I can dig a little bit to see if I can find what might be living here. Let's see here. I'm going to dig a little bit. Let's see. Oh. Where'd it go? I just saw a worm. That was super cool. Where'd it go? That's okay. Well, friends, if you don't have any tools like this, you can use your hands. You can use your sense of touch when you're exploring nature. Notice I have all this nice dirt in my hands. There are so many things that I'm seeing in this dirt. I'm using my, um, my eyes or my sense of sight to be able to look and observe what's in this dirt. So you can look. I see some pieces of wood, maybe some rocks, some roots. So I'm using that sense of touch. If you want, and you don't have to do this, I might see what the dirt smells like. Oh my goodness, friends. I just found a worm in the dirt. So I'm gonna observe, I'm gonna look at that worm. It's wiggling around a little bit. Sometimes um, I like to wiggle around like a worm. I don't know if you like to do that, but I'm looking at this worm and I'm very gently, if you find a worm or a bug while you're exploring using your senses, make sure that you're very careful and we're kind to the bug. We don't want to hurt it or squish it. Let's see here. So I found this worm. So I'm going to kind of get it a little bit closer. Can you see the worm moving around? That is so cool, friends. So the other thing I like to do when I find a bug is I want to make sure I put the bug back in its home where it came from. I want it to go back to um, its worm home. I don't want to keep it or take it home with me because the worm is going to go back in the dirt. That's where it lives. So also, if you really want to and you're feeling nice and brave, I just found this piece of wood here. I wonder what this wood smells like and that might seem kind of weird or yucky, but let's see. Well, it doesn't really smell like anything and that's okay. Um, but I'm using my senses, I'm exploring. I wonder if this wood makes any noise. I'm gonna use my ears or my sense of hearing. Let's see. No, it's not making any sounds. So I don't hear anything and that's all right. 
And also, again, I'm, I have my sense of taste, but I don't want to taste anything because my hands are dirty and that's kind of yucky. So I'm not going to um, use my sense of taste. So, but what I want to encourage you to do and challenge you is to maybe go outside and use your senses. You can use, you have some amazing tools right here. You have your hands and you can go and you can explore and you can dig, you can find all kinds of cool things just right there in your own backyard or your own neighborhood or in your own schoolyard. So remember friends, we can use our senses to be scientists. We can look and observe with our eyes. We can look all around. We can hear, we can use our ears to um, listen for different sounds. We can use our nose to smell, to uh, see what kinds of different smells are around. And then also we can use that sense of touch. I'm feeling all these things in my hands right now. This dirt feels pretty cool. Um, it's kind of cold, but uh, it feels pretty awesome just to kind of have the dirt in my hands. So again, friends, I challenge you to go and try this um, with one of your adults. Go outside and see what you can find by using your senses. All right, friends, I have here some bugs. These are insects. We have a fly and then we have a, some, uh, some beetles. We have a beetle here and a beetle here. So scientists, when they study animals, um, sometimes we can learn a lot about animals um, if they're no longer living. And that's totally okay because they're, um, we, there's a lot to learn about these bugs and they're really hard to catch. So if we can find a bug that isn't alive anymore, we can still use it and we can um, learn a lot about it. So I noticed some things about these bugs. What are some things that you notice or you observe using your eyes? What do you notice about these bugs? Well, I noticed the fly is pretty small compared to these other two. I noticed this one has these big pinchers on the front. So these bugs all look very different. And that's what's really interesting when we learned about insects is they all um, have different things about them that are a lot different. Sometimes they can look the same, sometimes they can look a lot different. So in just a second, I'm gonna bring out um, another type of insect and we're going to see if we can notice some things about it maybe using our senses to be able to um, notice some of its special things about it hello again friends so what i would love to show you is we are at the zoo so i do have some animals that i would like to show you today or i have this one animal here and because um, it really wouldn't be possible for me to bring an elephant over to show you. Um, we have these animals that are a lot smaller that we're able to show you as students. Um, and we're able to really take a close look at these. So we're learning about our senses today. And I have an animal that um, has some really good senses. And um, I'm going to show you and we're going to think about maybe what kinds of senses this animal has. Or if you want to use your senses to help explore um, and observe this animal. All right, friends, so this is the Madagascar hissing cockroach. And if we look at the cockroach, he's inside this plastic box right now. But that's okay, because he has holes up top so he can breathe. Um, he also has this dirt down here at the bottom. And that's where cockroaches really like to be, um, is in that sort of dirt. And um, Sometimes when we think about bugs, you might go, ew, bugs are so gross. I don't like bugs, but bugs actually have a really important purpose. We um, really count on bugs because they, I call them nature's cleanup crew. So they like to eat dead leaves and old like rotten uh, fruit and, and wood and things like that. So they kind of clean up. So we, uh, they're actually really important. Um, and we, um, sometimes when we study them, we realize how important they are to us. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my friend here out. While I'm taking this animal out, I want you to think about what kinds of senses this animal might be really good at using. So here's the cockroach. What do you notice about the cockroach? 
I notice that the cockroach is being very still. I see that it's moving its antenna. And again, some of you might be going, oh my gosh, that guy is holding a cockroach. That's so yucky. Um, but this guy's actually really cool. Once I got to know this animal and I got to work with this animal, um, it, was, it was actually really awesome to learn more about it. Now they're called hissing cockroaches because they have a special ability. And I just put him back because he was getting really wiggly. And I want to make sure that he's feeling comfortable. Even though he's a bug, we want to uh, make sure that all of our animals are feeling nice and safe and happy. So I'm just going to put this lid back on because he was getting a little wiggly. But I'll bring him a little closer. What senses do you think this cockroach is really good at? You might have seen him using his sense of touch on my hand. But he looks like he's climbing on the side of this plastic box. Do you think that he has a really good sense of touch? And the answer is yes, they have. They're like Spider-Man. They can climb on um, things and plastic, things that we can't climb on because we would slide right off. So notice he's climbing right on the side of that plastic. So they get their name, the, uh, the hissing cockroach, because they have holes in the sides of their bodies. And sometimes when they get stressed out or something's trying to get them, they will go and they will make a hissing sound. They'll go and that's um, to let whatever's trying to get them, um, like another animal, that's trying to let them know, hey, leave me alone. I don't want you to try to get me. So he has a really good sense of touch. What about, hmm, what about sense of smell? So he probably doesn't have the greatest sense of smell, but they can sense things using those antenna on top of their head that you probably saw in my hand just a minute ago. So I'm gonna try to get them out one more time just so we can get another up close look. And one important thing to remember, friends, is if we see bugs, we wanna be very careful around bugs. So we don't wanna go and pick up bugs um, because sometimes they could pinch us or bite us and that's not very safe. So um, the best thing to do, especially when we see any animal in the wild or outside, um, I know I picked up that worm a minute ago, but we just wanna make sure it's okay with our adults before we pick up any um, insects or bugs. All right, so I'm gonna get a little bit closer maybe really close and we can see that he's got those that really tight hold right on my finger so he's got that incredible sense of touch so remember friends when we think about bugs they have a really important role so they're not just here to be pests um they actually help us out they're going around um, they eat all the dead leaves and dead um, pieces of sticks and things like that. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and put the cockroach away. But um, again, let's think about maybe if we find another bug, what is that bug good at doing using its senses? Is it really good at smelling? Do you think it has a really good um, does it have good eyesight? Can it see really well? So that's something that scientists think about. All right, friends, I'm gonna go ahead and put our cockroach away so we can go ahead and say bye, cockroach. Friends, I was so excited to learn about the cockroach today and learning about our senses and how we can use them in science. Let's go back to the classroom to see what we have learned. Oh my gosh, friends, that was so much fun being at the zoo today. Let's review what we learned. We learned that humans, animals, and scientists use their senses to observe and explore the world around them. The five senses were see, hear, smell, touch, and taste. One more time, those five senses are see, hear, smell, touch, 
and taste. Let's see if we made our goal today. Well, our goal was to learn about the five senses and how people and animals use their senses. Did we do that? You're right, we did, high five. Nice job learning about the senses today. Friends, thank you so much for joining me learning about the census today. I'm so excited to see you next time. Bye-bye. It's me, Ms. Steckmeyer, and I teach first grade at Strive Prep Ruby Hill in Southwest Denver. And I'm so happy to be here teaching ELD, or English Language Development. This is for kindergarten and first grade, our more intermediate or advanced friends. However, we would love everyone to join us because in ELD, we practice listening in English, speaking in English, writing in English, and reading in English. Let's get into today's lesson. It's called neighborhood. Neighborhood, that's where I live and the space around it. We have a writing goal. It says, I can make observations of my own neighborhood in a nature journal. Awesome. We also have a speaking goal. I can make predictions or inferences based on my observations. Huh, I see that word here two times, observations, observations. In a previous lesson, I used my handy dandy telescope to look up into the sky at the stars. I observed, or I noticed, or I saw different patterns in the sky. Well, today we're going to notice or see different things in our own neighborhoods. Put on your binoculars with me. What do you see in your neighborhood? I see a lot of tall trees. I see those trees with those string beanie things hanging from them. You guys know what I'm saying? Ooh, I see a lot of squirrels and different kinds of birds. Oh, a lot of geese, a lot of geese. Let's see, anything else? Ooh, some pine trees with pine cones, some bushes, some blue skies. And since I'm in my neighborhood, I see a lot of houses. Yeah, and sidewalks. I see power lines. I just made a lot of observations about my own neighborhood. Friends, I'm so happy to say that Mr. James is back. Last time he showed us Rio, who lives in the rainforest. And this time, Mr. James is going to show us an animal that lives in Colorado. I want you to see what observations you can make about this animal. When we come back, we're going to talk about what we see and what we notice about this animal. Are you ready? Okay, here's my time with Mr. James. Hi friends, it's me, Ms. Steckmeyer, and I'm here at the Denver Zoo with Mr. James. Hi, Mr. James. Hello, hello so, everybody. Awesome, today we are talking about observations mm -hmm. and how when we observe animals in our own backyard, it can help us learn more about the world around us. Yeah, how yeah. many of you guys go outside and look around? I know I do, and every time I go outside, I see something new. So today we're gonna to talk about an animal that has to use its observation skills to look yeah. at its environment around it. 
All right. Okay. Ready to meet our friend Henry? Yeah. I'm All right. Excited. Wonder what it could be. I could, don't know. Could it be a horse? Mm, horse is not going to fit in here. Not a horse. So if you're observing, you know a horse <laughs> would not be able to fit right in this spot. So it's got to be a smaller animal, right? Mm -hmm. Good observation. All right, let's see. Hmm, here he comes. Everybody, oh. this is Henry. Wow. Henry is a hippopotamus. No. <laughs> That would not be a good observation skill. <laughs> this is a box turtle, an ornate box turtle. They actually live right here in Colorado. And I'm gonna put him down in his little habitat that we have set up right here. Wow. And we're gonna kind of observe him. Now, he's looking around to make sure everything is safe. This is something new for him. So he's using his observation skills to go, oh, am I gonna fall off something? Is something gonna attack me? <laughs> and so when we look at him, we can look at what he does to stay safe, maybe. And so when you're looking around in your neighborhood, you can look under logs, right, or, or, or rocks, and observe what's underneath there. And these guys, right around this time, they like to hide under grasses and things like this. And so when we're <laughs> using our observation skills, we might see just a piece of this animal and go, oh, look, in a burrow, there's, a, there's something in there. And then when we look at it, we go, is this a tarantula? <laughs> no, because tarantulas have a lot more legs than Mr. Henry here. Mm -hmm. So if we're observing, we can see he has one, two, three, and four legs. Mm -hmm. All right. And he has a really, really long neck. Yeah. So some turtles would have a, 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 a shell that's more thin or a shell that's a different color. Yeah. He's peeking up with his neck. Oh, he yep. went inside. Yeah, when he doesn't feel safe, he thinks, oh, oh something's gonna ah. come at him. He can go into his shell, and then he uses his other skill of observation, listening. He can mm. listen and see if it's safe, and then he can come out of his shell. Wow. Yeah. Let's see, what else can we observe on him? We can observe on him that he has very sharp claws. Yeah. And that helps him dig in the dirt. And that also helps him pull himself along the ground. Now, a lot of people think that turtles live in water. And how many of you observed a turtle that's been in the water swimming around? I know I have. I saw some this summer. Mm -hmm. Well, this one I would not have seen because he's a land turtle. Mm -hmm. If we were to put him in water, bloop, he would just sink to the bottom like a rock because he doesn't swim. So when we look and observe turtles that are in the water, they have webbing between their toes to push them in the water. He does not have that webbing between his toes. So we can observe that he does not have that webbing. And he also, his shell is kind of round. You yeah. notice that? Did you observe that's mm -hmm. round? So okay. usually turtles that have a rounder shell are kind of like tortoises. And they are more on land. Mm. There's some exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, if you're a water turtle, your shell is a lot more flatter. So you can observe, if you saw a turtle in your backyard like this, would you go, hmm, is this a land turtle or is this a water turtle? And one way you can tell is looking at their feet, looking at their shell, and where did you find them? Did you find them really far away from water? Did you observe that there was no water around? It's probably a land turtle. Or did you find them somewhere that was close to water? That would probably be a, a water turtle. Yeah. Does it have scales on its Good arms? observation. Does it have scales? What do you think? Does it look scaly? It, yeah, it looks kind of rough. It looks kind of rough, yeah. And some people think that reptiles, this is a reptile, are slimy. Mm. And that's because sometimes some reptiles are in the water and they do have wet skin when they come out of water. Mm. But reptiles are dry and scaly. Oh, okay. Yeah. So those scales that you see are these little things, all like little circles and stuff, and it's very, very dry. Yeah. So are, are turtles reptiles or amphibians? They are reptiles. Okay. Yeah, reptiles. Amphibians go through two lives. They start their life in the water, and then they change into something else, right? And do you think she changed? No. 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 She hatched out of eggs, and she was just a, he was just a little turtle, and then he grew up to be a bigger oh, turtle. Got it. Yeah, so definitely good question. Not an amphibian, but a reptile. I think I also noticed a little tail. 
Yep, they do have a little tiny tail. I don't know if anybody <laughs> could see it. It's so, so tiny. He's got it kind of tucked yeah, and turned in there. In. What's really cool about a box turtle and something that you can observe on a box turtle is I don't know if you can see there's a line right there. Yeah. That is like a hinge on a door. Oh. So a hinge on a door kind of helps you close things, right? He could actually put his head, his feet, his tail, and close up in his shell <laughs> just like that. Not all turtles can do that. Like a sea turtle, they cannot do that. Yeah. Wow. So when he's threatened, boop, he'll go into that shell and he'll listen and he'll observe with his ears and then he observes with his eyes. Is it safe? And he'll stick his long neck out like that. And if it's still not safe, <laughs> boop, back on the shell. Right now in Colorado, it's getting a little bit colder. And so if you went outside trying to find a turtle like this, you probably wouldn't find it. They're getting ready for winter. Mm. So you probably wouldn't observe one of these in the wild right now. But in the summer when it's warmer, they come out of that shell. They come out from underneath where they, they were down in the ground. And they come out and you can see them and observe them in the wild. Wow. Oh, oh, where are you going? To get out. You want to look out there? Yes, okay, I'll look. let you look. But I don't want you to fall out there, buddy. <laughs> All right. So the pattern on the shell, what does that tell us about this turtle? That's a good question. He's called an ornate because this is kind of like an ornate pattern. That's yeah. where he gets his name. It's also called a western turtle. But that pattern helps him camouflage, blend in. Ah. So a lot of times when we're observing, we might walk by something and not even see it because it's hiding, it's camouflaging. So, cam so those mm. little stripes on there help him hide and they look like sticks or pieces of grass where they, yeah. he would be found in the grassland. And so it helps him blend in and hide. Amazing. Yeah. Good Hi. observation. Hi. Yeah. Okay, I have one more question. Yes. Does this turtle bite? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> have you gotten bitten? Not me. No, no. No, nope, nope. And that's because we keep our hands away from his mouth. Anything yeah. with a mouth can bite, right? <laughs> and it's not that Henry's mean. He's not going to get up in the morning, yeah, I'm going to go bite Mr. James today. No, but if I was bothering him, how's he going to stay safe? Well, he'd probably go into his shell. But if I kept bothering him, he would probably snap and bite at me. He's got a beak like a bird. He doesn't have any teeth. <laughs> and so that little beak could chop down on my finger if he felt very threatened. Okay. But you'll notice he's not trying to snap at us and bite us because we, he knows we're good friends. Yeah. But in the wild, if you were to pick up a turtle, you might get bit because they don't know if you're a friend or not. They, they don't go have every day somebody picking them up, right? <laughs> Henry's kind of used to it. He's an education animal here, mm. an ambassador animal at the Denver Zoo. Well, yeah. he's so handsome. Yeah, he is. <laughs> turtles have a lot of character. It's something you can observe about turtles. You can notice their faces and they have a lot of character. Yeah. yeah. Look there he is, that. open his Same mouth there. <laughs> wow. What a neat what a cool guy. guy. Right? Thank you, Mr. James, for you are teaching so us welcome. all about the box turtle. I can't wait to get out in my own backyard to see what animals I can observe. Oh, maybe not a turtle, but... Maybe not a turtle, but definitely <laughs> birds. Insects are easy to find. Ooh. Pretty interesting. Okay, thank you, Mr. James. You can't are welcome. to come back and visit. Oh, yeah, definitely. Bye, Bye. And we're back. That was awesome. I loved meeting Henry. Thank you, Mr. James, for introducing me to Henry. Now let's talk about what we see or notice about Henry. So even though we just watched a clip about Henry, we're going to still use the present tense, like it's happening right now. Okay. Hmm. On Henry, I see sharp claws. I see sharp claws. Your turn with me. Ready? Go. I see sharp claws. Nice work. What do you think that means about Henry? Or what does that tell you? My turn first. I think that means Henry is a good digger. Let's try it together. Ready? Go. I think that means Henry is a good digger. Nice work. Let's try I notice. I notice. Hmm. I notice Henry inside of his shell. Your turn with me. Ready? Go. I notice Henry inside of his shell. Nice work. What do you think that tells you? Can you make a prediction? You might have said, this tells me that Henry is scared, or this tells me that Henry 
feels threatened. Let's try. This tells me that Henry is scared. Ready? Go. This tells me that Henry is scared. Okay. One more thing I talked about with Mr. James is Henry's skin. Henry has scales. So we could say, I notice scales. Or you can challenge yourself. I see that Henry has scales. Let's try the challenge sentence. I see, ready? With me, go. I see that Henry has scales. Good. What does that tell you? Or what does that mean? You might have said, I think that means that Henry is a reptile. Or this tells me that Henry is a reptile. Let's try this sentence together. Ready? Go. This tells me that Henry is a reptile. Nice work. We made so many observations about Henry with Mr. James and those observations tell us not only about Henry, but about the world around him and the world around us. You heard Mr. James say that you could tell just by looking at Henry's shell if Henry could swim or not, right? You could also tell by looking at his claws and seeing that he did not have webbed feet. So this is a land turtle. Up next, we are going to make our own observations of our neighborhood to see what we can learn about the world around us. So get out your binoculars. They can be imaginary if you want. And all you need to make your own nature journal is a piece of paper and a pencil. That's all you need. If you have a journal, go ahead and get that. Okay, let's get started on our nature journals. Friends, you can do this in your backyard or at a local park. And be sure to ask an adult if you can go outside or take an adult with you. Okay, since we're, you know, in our living rooms or wherever you watch TV, I'm going to show you an example of some great journaling behavior. Yeah, journaling behavior. It's really important. So, hmm, first we make an observation. I want to, I want to draw the habitat or the environment before I draw anything else. Okay, so actually I'm facing a window so I do see outside. I see a street and a fence. And I see a big tall tree. Big tall tree and it kind of is one of these pine trees. So after I make an observation, I'm going to do a sketch. This is a sketch. It's not a perfect piece of art, but it does show exactly what I'm seeing. That's what a sketch is, a nature sketch. Let's see how it's bigger at the bottom. here. Okay. What else do I see out here? Oh, I see a house actually. This house is in the background. It's kind of like that. Okay. And then I see another shorter tree. And that tree, oh, it has branches like this, actually. I'm just looking, and I keep looking back at nature to make sure I have an accurate drawing. Okay, a little window here, a little window here, and there's that fence. Okay. 
if we're lucky, we might see some animals, right? In my neighborhood, I usually see birds. Good job, you birds. I usually see some squirrels. I wonder if you see squirrels in your neighborhood. So I'm gonna draw a few squirrels on this fence. They have big bushy tails, little tiny legs, <laughs> little hands. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's my squirrel and here's this one. They're gonna be chatting with each other. Looks kind of more like a bird. That's okay. <laughs> Big fluffy tail. Awesome. Another thing you can do in your nature journal is you can label. So I'm going to label my trees. My squirrels. And my birds. And if you'd like to challenge yourself, you can write sentences about what you see. I see two squirrels. Or you could say, I notice, I notice birds flying, and maybe they're flying south. The biggest challenge of all is to think about what our observations tell us about the world around us. If we see birds flying south, that might tell us that winter time is coming. It's starting to get colder and the birds are flying to where it is warmer. If we see two squirrels, that might tell us there's food around because where there's squirrels, there's food. Okay, thank you so much friends for observing the world around you with me today. I learned so much about not only Henry, but about Henry's world and my world. Give yourself a brain kiss. You did an amazing job and I have to say, friends at home, friends across Colorado, Thank you for so much for joining me on Colorado Classroom. I have had so much fun and I'm so proud of friends at home, learning at home, and taking initiative to do these activities and to learn with me. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye. Welcome back to Colorado Classroom. Learners, my name is Adrian, Miss Adrian. I will be your teacher today for our very last lesson together. Welcome back to Animal Week, second and third grade English language development. Uh, last time we were together, we learned about Komodo dragons. And today we have another surprise animal that is very different than Komodo dragons, but also similar in some ways. So in just a minute, I will reveal to you what our special animal is for today. Um, but first, as usual, we need some special sciencey words that will help us talk about this animal, like scientists. Last time we learned the words predator, remember those big animals that eat the little animals, and prey, 
yeah, those are the smaller animals that are food for other animals, predators and prey. Okay, today we are learning about an animal that lives in lots of different habitats. Some of the habitats are urban, say that with me, urban. That means it's more like a city or a town where lots of humans live. There's more buildings, more cars, so urban, it's like a city. And these animals can also live in habitats that are rural. Say that with me, rural, rural, kind of a funny word. Rural are habitats that are more nature. So maybe it could be in the mountains, farmland, uh, smaller towns, there aren't as many humans and there aren't as many buildings and cars. Rural. It's more out in nature. So we have a rural and urban and our animal today, hint hint, can live in both of these habitats. It's very unique in that way. Okay, also to talk about our animal today, we will need some comparing words. So words that can help us compare sizes of things, um, shapes of things, okay? So, for instance, I could say, wow, that apple is really big. I could say, oh, okay. But this apple is even big, what would you say, bigger. Big er, so we put the er in the end. This apple's bigger. What would we say about this apple? Big, bigger. This apple is the biggest. Big est. Okay. So for remember adjectives describing words like big that only have one syllable. Big, right? If you hit the wall when you say it, it just makes one noise big. They follow this rule. Big, bigger, biggest. Okay, we could try another one. How about loud? Remember, I told you my cat Esme is loud. So I could say she's loud, but my friend's cat is loud. What's the next rule? Louder. Here, this will make this like a microphone image. Loud, louder. Oh, but that big old cat down the block is the loudest. Loudest. We add E-S-T on the end. So say it with me. Big, bigger, biggest. Loud, louder, loudest. Okay. It gets a little bit trickier though. If we have an adjective with more than one syllable. So how about beautiful? Oops, that marker does not work very well. How about the word beautiful? Okay, if we smack the wall and we say this word, beautiful, three syllables, beautiful, it follows a different rule because I can't say beautifuler. That sounds silly, okay? So now we would say, Oh, that, uh, that Komodo dragon is beautiful. <gasps> but the other one is even more beautiful. Okay. And then somebody else walks in with another Komodo dragon. <gasps> but this one is the, wait, what do I say beautifulest? The most beautiful. Most beautiful. Okay. So these longer adjectives follow a different rule. Beautiful, more beautiful, most beautiful. We could do it with expensive. Ooh, that watch my friend is wearing is very expensive. Three syllables. <gasps> but the one my other friend is wearing is even more expensive. Okay, you guys tell me. Huh, but that million jillion dollar watch I saw in the store is the, you got it, most expensive. Okay, 
So for short little words with one syllable like big, loud, small, tall, we've got big, bigger, biggest, loud, louder, loudest. For longer words like beautiful, expensive, we go beautiful, more beautiful, most beautiful, expensive, more expensive, most expensive. Okay, we are going to need these comparing words to talk about our special animal today, which is barn owls. Have you heard of barn owls before? Well, here's a picture of one, and we're going to learn a little bit about them before we take a field trip to meet one. Are you ready? So I want you to listen for examples of these comparing words we just learned about. Okay, and listen for details about the barn owl's habitat, diet, characteristics, and adaptations. Okay, barn owls. Introduction. There are many different types of owls that come in all shapes and sizes. The great horned owl is the largest type of owl, while the elf owl is the tiniest. The barn owl is a medium-sized owl, which is larger than an elf owl, but smaller than an eagle owl. Did you hear some good comparing words? All right, so look at these three different types of owls, how different they are. Habitat. Where does it live? Barn owls live all over the world. They live in urban areas like cities and in rural areas like farms, mountains, or forests. They like to build their nests in hollow trees, holes in a cliff, or even barns and buildings. Maybe that's why they're called barn owls. Diet. What does it eat? The barn owl is a predator, which means it eats other animals. Its prey includes mice, rats, smaller birds, lizards, and insects. Ooh, look at this picture. The owl caught some prey. The prey looks like a little mouse. Behavior, what do they do? The barn owl hunts at night and can track its prey in the dark. They usually spend time alone or in pairs of two. Oh, this one looks like she's sleeping during the day so she can hunt at night. Characteristics. What do they look like? Barn owls have heart-shaped faces, sharp beaks, and sharp talons or claws. They have a long wingspan and their eyes face forward. So in this picture we can see some of those characteristics. Adaptations. How do their bodies help them survive? Barn owls have special feathers that help them fly very quietly. This makes it easier for them to sneak up on their prey. So look at this picture. Can you see those kind of special feathers that might help them sneak? They also have excellent hearing, which helps them hunt at night when it is dark. Those are two ways their bodies and behavior help them survive. Okay, we're going to watch a quick video of a barn owl flying so you can see them in action. And then we're gonna take a field trip to meet a real life barn owl. Welcome back to the Denver Zoo. We were here last time talking about Komodo dragons and we are back to talk about a new animal today. This is my friend Caitlin who is an educator at the zoo and she's here with Casper who is a barn owl which is the animal we're studying today. How perfect. Yeah. Caitlin welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks. I'm excited to be back. Yeah. Casper here is very excited to meet you all and she was born right here in Colorado which is very cool. So Casper was born in a raptor rehabilitation center. That means that her mom got, in, got injured somehow, somebody rescued her, and when Casper was hatched, she was already living with people. So they thought it was a great time for Casper to come live at the zoo so that she could get used to meeting kids and adults and then teach them about this beautiful species that lives right here in Colorado. 
Wow. And we... Oh, oh boy, we look at those wings. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a production. Yes. Wow. So what can you tell us about Casper's habitat in nature? Yeah. And barn owls. Definitely. So barn owls are cavity nesters. That means that they nest, they have their home in a hole. That doesn't sound very specific, right? And it's not. So they might live in mines. They might live in the ground. They might live in hollows and trees. But the reason why they have their name is because they really do love to live in barns. Hmm. And a really cool story about barn owls <laughs> and kind of why Casper got her name is that they used to live in the rooftops of barns and farmers would come out to their barn at night and they'd open the doors to do whatever they were doing. The barn owls would swoop over their head in a blur of white feathers and out these owls don't go hoot hoot, they go scree. Oh. And so the farmers thought their barns were haunted. <gasps> so they thought it was a ghost? Yes. Oh. And so she's named after Casper the ghost. And sometimes these owls are also known as ghost owls. Wow, she even <laughs> kind of looks like a ghost a little bit. Yeah, she has this lovely heart-shaped face that really emphasizes those beautiful dark eyes yeah. that are one of her strongest assets. It's a great adaptation that she has to be able to see in the dark. I was going to ask why her face is shaped that way. How does that help? Yeah, and that is, actually has to do with her hearing. Oh. She has two really great senses her sense of sight and her sense of hearing. And so when her face is shaped, <laughs> don't poop on me, please. When her face is shaped like a heart, it brings the sounds that are coming towards her to her ears. So our ears are shaped like discs. So instead of having just a single uh, piece on your body that's shaped like a disc, her whole face is shaped like a disc to bring that sound to her ears. Wow. <laughs> what other adaptations does she have? Oh my goodness, she has so many cool adaptations. You may notice that Casper is able to move her head pretty far behind her. She can't move it in a full circle. If she did, huh? that would not be good. Uh -huh. <laughs> so she can, but she can look over her shoulder farther than we can. And that's because her eyes, they can't move side to side. All right, I want you to put your right hand up but then not moving your head, put it behind your ear and see, can you still see your, your hand? No. No? Move it a little bit further up? Yes. Now you can? Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Casper would have to move her whole head because she can't move her eyes side to side. Oh. We can move our eyes side to side and kind of see out of our peripheral different things. Casper can only have her eyes going forward. And so if I were to do that same thing, I'd have to move my whole head to see that hand. Wow. If I weren't moving my eyes. We, we had some questions about how barn owls are similar and different to other types of owls. Oh can yeah. Can you tell us any, any facts about that? Definitely, her, the shape of her face is one of them. Huh. So some barn, or some owls, will have just that circular face or they'll have tufts hanging up. And all of those things are different ways in which they're using their face shape to either emphasize their eyesight or their hearing. Wow. Casper's also really special, barn owls in particular, because they live in every continent except for Antarctica. Oh. So they can be found all over the world. They're the most common owl species. Wow. Are they bigger or smaller than other types of owls? Yeah, Casper's kind of a medium-sized owl. Okay. So there, we have a Eurasian eagle owl that's probably like this big. Whoa! But then there are pygmy owls that would be like this big. Wow. <laughs> and we, so she's somewhere in the middle. And we, we read somewhere that barn owls are pretty fast and pretty quiet when they fly. Is that true? Definitely, yes. The shape of her wings and even the shape of the feathers are what help with that really quiet flight. There is a great video of a barn owl's flight versus a hawk flight, and you can really hear the difference. Huh. Uh, scientists have been doing some studies 
And what makes that so special? How can we maybe help that in our designs of things like airplanes uh, wow. to become a little bit more silent? So learners, think about why would it be important for Casper to be so quiet when she's flying? Why would that be a helpful behavior? Hmm. Hmm. Can you tell us a little more about barn owls' diet and what they eat? Yes. So she loves to live in barns, and it's not just because she likes the color red or she likes living in the country. It's because barns are really popular for mice. Mice are some of her favorite foods. She loves mice and rats, maybe even some lizards and snakes. Wow. And so she'll eat all those things on the ground. And since farms have a lot of those things, it's a great place for her to live. But what's really cool too, is she is a really great bird for the city too. Huh. We have mice and rats in our cities. And so barn owls have actually adapted really well to living with people. Huh. <laughs> That's doing cool. a little thing her head. Yeah, and that would be if she's trying to pinpoint a noise. So she'll move her head and see how the sound reacts to where it comes into her ears, and she'll kind of be able to pinpoint where it's coming from. Wow. Are there any predators that try to eat her? Like, does she have to be scared of any other animals? Yeah, her biggest predators will be other birds of prey. Hmm. Yeah, and and then baby owls are, and eggs in particular will have more predators like snakes or maybe weasels and ferret type animals as well okay yeah wow are, but, there, are there any other cool facts we should know about barn owls yeah we haven't mentioned yet that she's nocturnal oh yeah <laughs> tell, tell our learners what that means that's yeah. a good word to know nocturnal means that she is awake at night so unlike you and me, I'm assuming, <laughs> we are diurnal, we're awake during the day. Casper is nocturnal and awake during the night. Now Casper is obviously a little bit of an exception because she is an education owl. So she, she's awake right now and she's okay with that. But if you want to spot any owls in your neighborhood, What's really cool is to go in your own backyard at night. Ooh. How is it different? What animals are you gonna see then? Maybe not even just owls, but maybe some bats or some different foxes prefer at night too. There's some really cool animals that you can see if you just go to the same place as you normally would at a different time of day. Wow, and if you hear that screech, screech, that might be a barn owl. Yes, exactly. Wow. Luckily, she's not doing it right now because it is pretty loud. It hurt our ears. <laughs> <laughs> How cool. Well, Caitlin and Casper, thank you for coming on our show today. Thank you. Um, I, could you explain a little bit in just a minute about what owl pellets are? Because when we oh, go back definitely. to the classroom, we're going to study some owl pellets. Yes. So maybe we'll say bye to Casper and then we'll talk about for owl pellets. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay, learners, now that we've met Casper and learned a few things about barn owls, let's take a closer look at some parts inside their body. Take a look at this. This is a model, so it's not an actual skull, but this is an owl, a model of an owl skull. So remember what Caitlin said about how owls cannot move their eyes? Do you see how they have bones all the way around their eye? So their eyes have to face forward. They can't move like humans' eyes. Also check out that sharp beak, right? That is one of the sharpest beaks I've seen for catching small mice and rats. Cool. Remember another characteristic was their sharp claws or talons on their feet, right? This is a print of an owl foot. Look how sharp those talons are for grabbing mice and rats and other small animals to eat. Whew, I would not want to see an owl coming at me with those sharp claws. And finally, what have we here? Take a look at this. This is a model of an owl skeleton. Wow, so remember Casper and everything we learned about her. This is what she looks like on the inside. So our owls invertebrates like insects and centipedes or are they vertebrates like humans 
Mm, you're right, they are vertebrates because they have bones and a spine on the inside of their body, not an exoskeleton. Look at that. So birds, owls and all birds have really lightweight bones so that they can fly easily, right? You can see this one kind of has its wings folded up. And actually, I just learned from Caitlin that that looks like a knee, but that's actually the bird's ankle. So their legs are shaped different than human legs, right? That is actually his ankle way up there. So look at these lightweight bones so that they can fly fast and quietly to catch their prey. How cool. Hi everyone, this is Caitlin. Uh, Casper and I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, owl casts. That's what I have here for to show you. And casts, or owl pellets, are really cool. So, owls don't have a knife and fork to eat their food. They are going to eat mice and rats all together. The fur, the bones, and that's the kind of things that owl stomachs and our stomachs just can't digest. So she will cough up this pellet or cast, which has all those things in it. If we take a look, we can see that there is some fur as well as some bones. Now this is really cool to find because it tells us what the owl has been eating. So if we were to take this all apart, we would know all about an owl's meal. And actually, learners, back in the classroom, we are going to get to take apart our very own owl pellet and see what kind of things are in there. That is so cool! This, the ones that you will have and the one that I have here have been baked in an oven so that there aren't any uh, contaminants or bacteria on it and it's totally safe to really investigate and get into. I hope that you use your curiosity to take apart this owl pellet and really learn something about owls and all the cool ways that our body uses some of these things. Like coughing up this owl pellet, that's just amazing that they can eat a whole animal and then get rid of the parts that they don't like. Wow, we can learn a lot about their diet from owl pellets. Definitely. Cool. Well, guess what? I'm super excited because now that Caitlin has told us about owl pellets, we actually have some that we can do some scientific observation with. Are you guys ready to get dirty with me? So remember, just like Caitlin said, owl pellets are not poop. They are the bones and fur and feathers from the owl's prey that the owl can't digest. So they cough it back up. It's like a hairball. If you have a cat that sometimes coughs up a hairball, Esme does that sometimes. This is like an owl hairball. So we can learn about the owl's prey. What did that owl have for lunch just by looking at their owl pellet? What I have here um, are some owl pellets that I ordered from online and it came with this bone chart. Uh, this kit is from the Mountain Home Biological Company um, so you can order from them or if you just look up online how to order owl pellets or a bone sorting guide uh, you can find this stuff uh, and order it online or buy it in an educational store. So here we have a bone chart. This is giving me an idea of what are some of the animal skeletons I might find in one of these owl pellets. So did this owl eat a mole? Did this barn owl eat a shrew? So here's the pictures of the animals. Did this owl eat a different so side, a different type of rodent? Did it eat a bird? So these are some of the common types of prey that barn owls might eat. And we can tell by looking at an owl, an owl pellet. It also tells us the types of bones we might find in here. So a skull, it's like your head bone, a jaw bone, that's your teeth. Uh, so all these different types of bones come from their legs, their feet. So let's open one up and see what we can find. All right, luckily I do not mind getting dirty, but you can wear um, gloves if you don't want to get dirty. I have a pair of tweezers here to help me, um, to help me pull it apart. So I'm going to move this. Okay, so here's my owl pellet. You can see, and so there might be some fur or some feathers in here. I'm just going to 
pull it open. You have to be careful though, because we don't want to break the bones inside. We want to know what sort of bones these are so we can learn about the barn owl's diet. <gasps> There's a bone. Let's see, if I look at my chart, that looks like a fibula. Mm, so that probably came out of one of this animal's uh, legs. Okay, finding some different types of bones. I think the best clue will be the skull. <gasps> oh, look at this. I think I'm finding a skull. I'm gonna use my tweezers to help me pull this apart. I can put this where you can see it. Take a look at this skull I found. All right, I notice, I observe that it has kind of big eyes. And can you see those teeth? It has long, two long teeth in the front, which makes me think, was this a bird? Do birds have teeth like that? No, this was a rodent, so this was a, type of small mouse or rat. So remember our different diagrams? If I look at these skulls, hmm, I think maybe it looks like a little, uh, a little mouse or something with those long teeth. Okay, so we, we know that this barn owl had a mouse or a rat for lunch. And look, I found the jaw bone. That's the bottom, the bottom teeth. So see how they fit together like that? All right, can you imagine it chewing? Look at those sharp teeth. If you've ever seen a mouse or a rat, they have very sharp teeth. Okay, we have identified what it could be. Let's keep pulling out some other bones and see what other types of bones we can find. All right, learners, you are never gonna guess what I found in here. Whoa, I think I got almost, almost all the bones out, but guess what? I found one skull two skulls, three skulls, four skulls. So it looks like this barn owl was super hungry because she ate four mice for lunch, right? Or a four-headed mouse. No, mice only have one head. One, two, three, four skulls. And look at all these jaws, all these teeth. Wow, okay, we found, I found some arm bones and some leg bones. So what were our clues that these were mice and not birds? Well, one clue was this fur, right? Birds don't have fur, they have feathers, right? So fur makes me think it was a mouse or a rat. And then also these teeth, right? Do birds have big long teeth like that? No, they have beaks. Right, so those are my two clues about these characteristics that make me guess that this, this barn owl's lunch, her diet, was for mice. How cool. Okay, so learners, we are going to head back to the classroom pretty soon, um, but first, a final word from our friend Caitlin at the Denver Zoo. Hi, Adrian. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of connecting to wildlife warriors in your classroom. I did want to invite you all to come visit us here at Denver Zoo. You can reserve your tickets or you can uh, explore with us some more at home at our virtual classroom at denverzoo.org. Thank you and see you soon. Learners, we have come to the end of our very last lesson together for now. We might be back another season, I'm not sure. I hope you don't forget our new sciencey words that we learned, rural, right? Places with lots of nature and urban, places with lots of humans and our stuff. Okay, I hope you had fun learning about barn owls today with me. I definitely had fun. I think I'm gonna try and take a night walk with my mom or my sister to see if I can hear them screeching. Okay, it's our 10th lesson together, which means we get to finish our riddle. What has 10 letters and runs or starts with gas. What has 10 letters and starts with gas? 
Okay, we have A-U-T-O-M-O-B-I-L. Can you guess the last letter? Mm, dun, 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 dun. The last letter is E. What does that word say? That's a long word. Automobile. Automobile. That's another word for a car. Do you get the riddle now? It has 10 letters and starts with gas, right? Your automobile, your car can't start without gas. If you speak Spanish, this is just like a Spanish word, automobile, right? It's very similar. I can't believe we've had 10 lessons together. Learners, it has been so much fun learning about animals and space and arthropods and poetry with you. I have really had fun. So if, if you only remember one thing from our time together, I hope you will remember that learning and education can happen everywhere, right? It's not just in the classroom at school. It's not just at your house. You can learn outside. You can learn in a book. You can learn talking to other people. You can learn in the mountains. You can learn at the zoo, right? Education happens everywhere. So I hope you will remember that. I hope you will get your family members to go dig up some bugs and write some poetry with you. And I will hopefully see you back another time. Bye, learners. to talk about the gopher snake. We're going to compare and contrast it to its rattlesnake partner and see what adaptations that gopher snake has to survive. Can't wait to learn with you. I'm really excited because something you should know about me, I love snakes. I've always loved snakes. It was something that I brought to my kindergarten show and tell was a snake that was taller than my mom was and I love them. So I can't wait for you guys to see what we have in store today. Hey boys and girls, so here we are at the Denver Zoo and I have my new friend Ronnie who has some awesome things to show us about snakes. Check this out. Thanks so much. Um, I have Collins who is a gopher snake. And guys, look at this gopher snake. Check out his patterns. This is our cool gopher snake. And something really neat about gopher snakes is that they can pretend to be rattlesnakes. So you guys might have been learning some things about rattlesnakes, and you might um, take a look at its head as the first thing to see whether or not this is a rattlesnake. So if you ever spot a snake on a trail in Colorado and you see one of these, you're gonna wanna be very cautious. You're obviously, you're not gonna wanna touch it or try to pick it up no matter what, but look at its head. You can see that right now, this guy's head is just kinda skinny. And if it was a rattlesnake, do you guys remember what shape rattlesnake heads are? They're a pretty distinctive sort of, almost like an arrowhead shape um, with sort of lumps on the side. But something really cool that gopher snakes can do is puff out the sides and backs of their heads. And so they can kind of pull their neck muscles and make their heads look like the shape of a rattlesnake's head. Interesting. And so that would be where those venom sacs are on the sides. They don't really have venom sacs, they're just pretending. So they, they would do that then so that people will mistake them for a rattlesnake then. Exactly. People okay. and animals, especially something like birds, bigger birds that might want to try to eat them, like a hawk. Uh, if it sees them and thinks it's a rattlesnake, and maybe they've encountered other rattlesnakes before, ooh, they might try to stay away because that seems a little too dangerous. 
Okay. And definitely so, people would too. So if a rattlesnake bites something like a, a bird or a hawk, what happens to the, the bird or the hawk? That's a really good question. It depends on how much um, venom they, 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 that goes into them when they bite and it depends on how big the animal is usually. So it can just be a really nasty bite or it could kill them. Okay. Yeah. So it depends on the amount of venom and how big the thing is that they, that they bit. Well, no wonder why he wants to pretend like he is one. <laughs> yeah, but uh, a lot of people would ask me while I'm holding a snake like this, oh, but can he bite you? Would, would he hurt you? And there's no way I would be handling a venomous snake like this. So right. that's one clue for you guys that this guy's not really venomous, even if he's pretending to be. The other really cool thing that these guys can do to make themselves uh, sort of try to pass themselves off as rattlesnakes is they have an adaptation where they'll hit their tail they'll sort of shake their tail against leaves and stuff like that. So they'll go into a pile of dried leaves if they're scared. Like, I just saw the shadow of a hawk. I don't know what to do. Oh, there's a pile of leaves. They'll go in it and then they'll start furiously shaking their tail against the leaves and it will sound like a rattlesnake. Interesting. So if that bird was like, wait, it's not really a rattlesnake and then it hears that rattling sound, it might be like, okay, it's a rattlesnake. I don't want to risk it. Yeah, I don't want to <laughs> risk it. And it might just be easier to go after some other animal. Yeah. Yeah. That so makes sense to me. That is what these guys do. So that's pretty cool. So awesome. Yeah. Um, but it, what about the patterns? Is that any different um, from the rattlesnake or is that pretty similar? It's pretty similar to a lot of rattlesnakes. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they can have that, that cool broken up pattern to help them with a kind of camouflage where if you break up their silhouettes it's harder to see that it's like one thing and it looks like a bunch of different things or like dappled shadows um so that's pretty similar to a lot of rattlesnakes okay sometimes rattlesnakes will have very very colorful markings to warn you like hey i'm 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 venomous stay away okay. and so this is more like the broken up um more uh camouflage pattern okay yeah and how big can this guy get this guy, um, this is this is a fairly small gopher snake, actually. Um, they can be, they can get up to like four or five feet long, and they can be. I would say he could be twice as wide as he is now. Oh my goodness! I've seen some massive gopher snakes out in the wild, wow. and they they can be really big. So boys and girls, five feet long. I'm only five feet five, <laughs> so that's like my height. If we stretch is the how, top to how tall this this snake can get that's yeah. huge this guy i'm estimating is only about three feet long three feet uh, he's all wrapped up but yeah he, he's coil. a pretty small young okay. one okay yep awesome and he eats what that's a really great great question so think about what you think this snake might eat i'm gonna let you guys think about your answer for a minute all right you guys have your answer these guys, their favorite thing to eat and the favorite thing of most snakes is mice. Mice. So think about why it might be called a gopher snake though. They, 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 they're probably seen going into holes in the ground. And around here, it's probably more likely to be a prairie dog hole than a right. gopher hole. But they would love to eat a, a prairie dog or a gopher. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but but a snake this size is probably going to only try to eat a baby gopher or a baby right. uh, prairie dog, if unless it gets really lucky and finds a big one that's that's old or, or injured or something. Okay. Um, these guys love to eat mice. Most snakes are great at eating them. And um, since this guy is a constrictor type snake, you can see he's really, really good at wrapping. Squeezing, right? Squeezing. squeezing. He, I, don't, I hardly have to hold on, right? He's holding yeah. on to me. Since he's good at squeezing um, and he doesn't really have fangs and venom, the way that these guys would catch a mouse is they would actually sort of ambush him and try to bite him Sounds gross, but he'd try to bite him on the face <laughs> and oh, then gosh. grab him with his body and <laughs> try to grab him. Just, just, he'd try to hold him still, basically, okay. and then try to try to squeeze around him. Okay. And then, uh, and then keep squeezing and then try to get him in their mouths. Oh my and, goodness. Yeah, and that's what they do. So. Okay, and I notice his tongue is just going crazy. Will you yeah. explain what what snakes use their tongue for? Absolutely. So right now, this guy. He is wondering if we both showered today. He's like, hmm, I want to taste the air and see if uh, these guys are wearing deodorant. Um, yeah, they can actually stick out their tongues. Every time they do, tiny little particles in the air that we can't even see land on their tongues. And then their tongues go in their mouth and rub against the roof of their mouth 
and they have this thing called a Jacobson's organ, and cats and other animals actually have this too. It helps them translate what's on their tongue into like a taste, basically. So they can taste the air. They can they can rub those air particles against their roof of their mouths and learn like what it's coming from. So they can say like, oh, do you have shampoo still in your hair that you didn't rinse out good enough? Oh, is that a mouse over there? Right. Did you bring me something to eat today? Exactly. And you might have noticed that they have a forked tongue. So their tongue is like a Y shape. It goes in these two directions. Mm -hmm. And that's super useful because particles land on both of those parts. And if there are, let's say, mouse particles in the air and they're more on the right side of the tongue, then the snake will be like, oh, the mouse is on the right side. I'll go to the right direction. Oh. So that actually helps like them figure, yeah, yeah. figure out their directions of what, what it is that they're looking for. Interesting. Yeah, pretty cool. So cool. Well, I'm glad that we got to see this snake. He's pretty awesome. Yeah, he's super wiggly right now. He is, so he's he is very active right now. He's wondering where his, his breakfast is He probably right now. is, yeah. <laughs> Maybe look for a, a mouse to eat or Yeah. Something. So awesome. Thank you so much, Mr. You're, Ronnie. You're absolutely welcome. Bye, guys. Right. So gopher snakes are non-venomous. And the way that we know that they're non-venomous is any snake that's a constrictor. So a constrictor is the ones that wrap themselves around their prey, or they're the ones that would wrap themselves around your arm if you held them and they would squeeze really, really tight. So think of constrictor like constricting. Um, those are non-venomous. Those are the, the squeezing snakes. So non-venomous means no poison. Gopher snakes like to live in a wide variety of habitats. So they have a whole bunch of habitats that they live in. They like prairies, they like deserts, and they like forests and woodlands and brush and all kinds of fields, anywhere where they can find food. And so what gopher snakes like to eat is, well, first of all, gophers. That's how they got their name, right? They like to burrow down into the ground, into the gophers layer, and they can actually eat the gophers that live there. They also like small mammals, so think of like mice, rats, things like that. They like to eat birds, lizards, and kind of interesting, they'll eat other small snakes too. They'll eat insects and they really like eggs and so that's a funny one to me is that they will go and find eggs and they'll swallow those eggs whole inside of their stomachs and you can actually kind of see it as it works its way through their stomach. So look at the pattern of the gopher snake, boys and girls. Look at how their backs are patterned with these brown and black blotches and it's usually on either a gray to a yellow background. So it's they have a gray to yellow background with all of these um, patterns of brown and black like splotches all over their backs. And then, if you look at their bellies, if you flip them over a little bit, you can see that they're yellowish white, and every so often there's a couple of little dark spots. There's also a really dark line that runs across the snout and extends beyond the eyes. So it goes across their snout, so their snout would be their nose, right? And then back behind their eyes, and it can go this way, or it can go this way. So what are the reasons why the snake would have these colors. Well, we know a lot about adaptations so far, right? We're in third grade, and so we know a lot about adaptations. And we know that these snakes need to be able to hide. These snakes need to be able to hide for two different reasons. One, because they don't want to be eaten by predators. They don't want to be scooped up by birds. And so they want to be able to hide in whatever the terrain is that they live in. They also want to be able to eat their food. And so they need to be able to sneak up on animals. And so again, they need to be able to camouflage into whatever their landscape is that they live in. Um, some interesting things about gopher snakes is that there are some species that can be albino. And albino means completely white. And so think about that. Would that make it really easy for gopher snakes to hide or really hard? Really hard, right? A bright white snake that's slithering in the dirt or in the prairie or in grass, mm, that's going to be really easy to spot, don't you think? Okay, let's talk about how long these animals live. Gopher snakes can live in the wild from 12 to 15 years. That's their average lifespan, from 12 to 15 years. Out in the wild, 
<laughs> the snakes have to contend with a whole bunch of predators and harsh conditions and cold and not enough food and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In captivity, they don't have all of those problems, right? They have somebody who will take care of them. They'll have somebody who will feed them and put a heat lamp in to keep them warm and always make sure that they're well taken care of. So in captivity, these snakes can live up to 33 years. So that is a really long time, a really long time in comparison to in the wild. So gopher snakes are like most reptiles. They enjoy the heat. They, they like to be nice and warm. However, when the temperatures get too hot for these snakes, they will hunt at night. They'll become more active at night. These snakes will also hibernate in the colder climates that they live in and during times when food is scarce. So their bodies will actually say, you're starving, it's time to go to sleep for a long time. And that will help them survive through these periods of time where they aren't able to eat for very long. These snakes are really good swimmers and they're really good climbers. So there's basically no terrain that they can't get through. So they can swim through water and they can climb up trees looking for birds' eggs, looking for birds that are just on branches, things like that. They can also dig into mammals' burrows. They can get into the dirt, which is really, really interesting because they have this thing on their snouts and they have these pointed little snouts and they have this thing that helps them to dig. So think of it like a shovel on top of the snake's head. Isn't that really interesting? And then as they catch their prey, they'll constrict it. So they'll squeeze it really, really tightly and then they swallow it whole because remember, snakes can't really chew. They just open their jaw and it opens really, really, really wide and then they are able to just engulf their entire prey. Such an interesting thing to watch. Another thing that you guys might find interesting, because I certainly do, is that snakes can't hear. They're essentially deaf to anything that is like an airborne sound. So an airborne sound is like my voice carries through the air, but they can hear vibrations. So if I were to like tap on this table, it makes a vibration. Think about like drumming and stuff like that. You can feel the vibration in that. So snakes can hear through their inner jaw. It's like an inner ear and they can hear with like vibrations through there. These snakes have no eyelids. Like all other snakes, they have no eyelids, which means that when they sleep, they sleep with their eyes open. As these snakes grow, because obviously, these snakes did not start at five or six feet tall, right guys? They started pretty small. As they grow, what they have to do is they have to shed the out part, outer part of their skin. And so you can find snake peels all over the place. Anywhere that snakes are, you're going to find a snake peel. And it just looks like a snake, but with nothing in it. So it's just like this dry, crackly skin that they peel out of, and then they grow. And then every time that they grow a little bit more, they'll peel again, and they continue to grow and shed and grow and shed as they go. And here we come into my favorite adaptations and my favorite fun facts about the gopher snake, which is going to tie us into rattlesnakes. Gopher snakes, when they are threatened, when they are um, either threatened by humans or by prey or when they're just scared, they will coil their body. So coil, think of like a circle. They're going to coil their body. They'll raise their head and then they'll start shaking its tail really, really rapidly. And what happens with this is if they live in the dry desert or in a dry field, think of like a wheat field, if they start shaking their tail in there, it's going to sound like a rattlesnake. And so they have created this really great adaptation. They look like the rattlesnake and then they can also sound like the rattlesnake by shaking their tail like that. Isn't that a cool adaptation? Because humans would hear that and think, I'm not going near that. And same thing with hawks and other birds like that. They're going to hear that and think, uh, not worth the meal, I'll find my dinner somewhere else. So what a cool adaptation that they have, isn't it? So boys and girls, when we hear about snakes, often people get kind of squeamish about them and people don't like snakes and they tell you how much they don't like snakes. But honestly, snakes are really good for our environment. They are really good for human population and here's why. They help control the pest animals. They get rid of the little things that destroy crops. They eat mice. Who likes mice? 
basically no one. So the snakes will eat the mice and they'll eat all these little insects and they help keep the populations down. So you guys, you probably have heard a whole bunch that mice carry diseases and other rodents like that carry diseases. Well, if the snakes are eating the mice, then they help control the diseases also that those mice would have spread otherwise. So snakes are actually really helpful to humans. There's a really great connection between the two. And so we need to keep remembering that even these creepy crawly animals have a great purpose in life. They have a really great purpose and a really great connection for humans. Okay, so before we can compare and contrast gopher snakes to rattlesnakes, we need to have some information about rattlesnakes. So interesting things about rattlesnakes. They live roughly the same time period that a gopher snake would live. So they average about 10 to 20 years. So pretty close to a gopher snake's lifespan. They also are around the same length. They average about five and a half feet, which if you remember the gopher snake was between five and six feet. So around the same length too. The main difference, in my opinion, would be the tail, right, boys and girls? The, the rattlesnake actually has a rattle on the end of their tail, and the gopher snake does not. And so the rattlesnake doesn't have to hit its tail against different plants or shrubbery and things like that. The rattlesnake can just simply shake its tail, and it rattles, and that ha that's how it got its name. Another difference between the gopher snake and the rattlesnake is that the gopher snake has like an oval shaped head, so almost like a circle, almost like an egg, so like an oval shaped head. And the rattlesnake's head is a triangle. It's shaped like a triangle. And so if you were able to get close enough to the two different snakes, you could compare the gopher snake's almost rounded head to the rattlesnake's very distinctive pointed head. If you look at the patterns of the gopher snake, and the rattlesnake, you're going to see that they do look pretty similar. They both have very similar colorings. If you were just to look at them from above or just to look at them from a side view or something like that, it would be really easy to confuse the two because they can sound alike. They are often mistaken for each other. And so we are going to transition really quickly into a compare and contrast paragraph. I really want to take all of the information that we have just talked about with the gopher snake and the rattlesnake. And I know that we haven't talked a lot about rattlesnakes, but we have enough information that we can compare and contrast a rattlesnake to a gopher snake. And I want to make sure that we have plenty of time to do this because this is a really great skill for third graders to have. And so the first thing that I'm going to do kiddos as I'm going to grab my piece of paper and before I start any kind of writing at all I like to have a plan in place and so maybe you've heard of something before called a Venn diagram and a Venn diagram is just two big circles that overlap each other like this and you have some items in here that are specific to this creature and some items in here that are specific to this creature and everything that is in the inner circle, the two that combine, those are the things that are similar. This is totally fine for compare contrast. However, I am not a great artist. That is not my life strength. And so this ends up sometimes getting a little messy for me and a little bit hard for me to read. So I actually use a different strategy. I actually use something called a a um, double bubble and so this is a way for me to map my thinking and what I do is for this particular paragraph I'm just going to write two things that are the same and two things that are different for each one so I'm starting with two circles two bubbles if you will and in it I'm going to put the gopher snake in one just writing that and in the other one, I'm going to put the rattlesnake, just writing that word. And then like I said, kiddos, like I said, I'm going to just come up with two things that are similar and then two things that are different. And so here's what that ends up looking like. And so, so one similarity that a gopher snake and a rattlesnake have is their patterns. They look really similar. And so I'm just going to draw a smaller circle or a bubble right in the middle and I'm going to put pattern because it do, I don't have to have a complete sentence for my plan. And then I'm going to draw a line 
to both the rattlesnake and the gopher snake. And then I'm trying to think of one more thing that they have in common, and the first thing that popped into my head is that they can make the rattle sound. So I'm going to put in another bubble and connect the two. And so I can tell that those are connected to the rattlesnake and the gopher snake. So now I'm gonna think of differences. And one of the things that I know is a difference is that the rattlesnake actually has a rattle. So I'm gonna do a little bubble on the side of just the rattlesnake. And it says rattle right here and it's only connected to the rattlesnake. And that way my brain can just see this better than the Venn diagram. And so this is the way that I like to do this. And then on this side, I'm going to do something that matches what I just wrote for the rattlesnake, which is that a gopher snake has no rattle. And I'll write that down. So that would be a difference. Or if we're doing compare contrast, that would be the contrast part. Okay, the other thing that I, I was thinking of as I was writing about the rattlesnakes is their heads. So the rattlesnake's head shape is triangle and the gopher snake has a round head. So again, those will just be in their own individual bubbles that are only connected to that specific snake. So now I have my plan and I can already see how I'm going to write this. And I can already see that I have two ways that these snakes are similar. And then, then I have two ways that they're different. So if I'm planning this out, I'm going to say that the gopher snake and the rattlesnake are alike because they have a similar pattern and they can both make a rattling sound. And then I could also say that they are different because the gopher snake doesn't actually have a rattle on the end of its tail while the rattlesnake does. And the gopher snake has a round head while the rattlesnake has a triangular head. So now I'm ready to write. I have my plan. I know exactly what I'm going to say. I'm going to write now. So boys and girls, I think that it is so much easier to have like a frame to go off of when we first are starting something new. So this compare contrast paragraph, this might be completely new for you. This might be the first time that you've done it. So I think that if I give you a frame to start with and that you just fill in the blanks, I think that that might end up working a little bit better for you. And it might be a little bit easier. And then when you get really good at these paragraphs, because you are going to get really good at these paragraphs, then you can transition from not needing that frame anymore and making your paragraphs more interesting and using your own voice in them. So to start with, I want you to start with a topic sentence. We have to make sure that our readers know that we're doing a compare and contrast paragraph. So, and we need to have our topics in there, which is gopher snakes and rattlesnakes. So we're gonna start by saying that gopher snakes and rattlesnakes have many similarities and differences. So there's my topic sentence. I'm going to compare and contrast similarities and differences. And then I'm just going to jump in with giving you details. The most important difference is that the rattlesnake has a rattle on the end of its tail and the gopher snake does not, period. Another difference is that the rattlesnake has a triangle shaped head while the gopher snake has a round head. And again, kiddos, I'm just taking this straight off of my plan that we already made together. Another way the gopher snake and the rattlesnake are alike is that their patterns look similar. Period. Although gopher snakes and rattlesnakes are different in many ways, they still have some similarities. So that was my conclusion sentence. That was how I wrap it all up and remind my reader that I am writing about gopher snakes and rattlesnakes as my topic, and that I'm doing a compare and contrast paragraph, so similarities and differences. And kiddos, this is just a really quick beginner compare contrast paragraph and as you get more comfortable they will become more more creative and have more voice and be way more interesting than just my frame that we have but this is a completely fine paragraph for a third grader to write and it was a really easy one to do you should be able to do it in around 10 to 15 minutes from start to finish
I do need to remind you something that I know a lot of third graders forget. Please make sure that you indent the first line of your paragraph. It's such an important thing to do. Make sure to indent, make sure to use capitals, make sure to use punctuation, and use your best handwriting. Kiddos, I've had so much fun with you learning about these creepy, crawly, slithering snakes and going on our field trip to the Denver Zoo. I am so thankful for Mr. Ronnie and all of his awesome expertise in showing us an actual gopher snake at the zoo. If you haven't checked out the reptile area, you guys definitely should. There are some really, really cool snakes other than just the gopher snake and the rattlesnake there. I can't wait to see you again next time. And for now, I'm gonna leave you with my good thing, which is I gotta see you guys every day. Take care, bye.